Welcome to the Extreme Chess Championship. Today, we have eight of the best young chess players in America competing to be the first Extreme Chess Champion. Crushing everyone's soul is in the realm of possibility. Whenever you lose, you're not happy. I think I'm gonna win. It's kind of like Survivor, right? I played in parks from Manhattan to Brooklyn. A lot of girls are better than guys. I have the best chess tactic. I'm gonna play aggressively and hope for the best. I'm chess expert Jonathan Corbla, and this is two-time U.S. Women's Champion Jennifer Shahadi. In the chess room, we have international chess master Greg Shahadi and our lovely host, Casey Marie. Extreme chess is extreme because it's way faster than these guys are used to playing. They have less than 20 minutes to make all their moves. In most tournaments, they have hours. A double-sided clock keeps track. When you're out of time, you lose the game. Stakes are high, but who's gonna win? We have some really exciting players. We have Sean and Casa playing in the first game. And we also have Justice versus Kevin. Then we've got Elena, a relative newcomer to the high stakes chess world, she's playing against Alex, the highest rated guy in the crew. And we have a jet setter, Elliot, who just came from Italy, gonna play against Alyssa. Alyssa is not only one of the top female players in America, she's also a philosophy student and a dancer. It's a single elimination knockout. If they lose a single game, they're out of here. We have our host, Casey Marie. Who's gonna give us a little refresher on the rules of chess. First, let's set up the pieces. There's eight pawns in the second row, rooks in the corner, knights, then bishops, queen on her color, and king by her side. The rook moves up, down, and sideways, as many squares as it wants. The bishops move on the diagonals. The queen is a combination of the rook and the bishop. It can move horizontally, vertically, diagonally. The knight moves in the shape of an L. It's the only piece that can jump over other pieces. The pawns can only move forward one square at a time. The first time you move it, you can advance too. The pawn can only capture diagonally. The king can move in any direction, but only one square at a time. When you attack the king, it's called check. If you check the king and he has no way out, that's called checkmate. The end. Game over. And now, our first game of the Extreme Chess Championship, we have Sean versus Casa. How do you feel about your matchup with Casa? I feel like I'm gonna have to definitely fight very hard. It should be a great match. I know Sean. Um, we've gone back and forth a couple times. Of course, there's a, a little butterflies. At this point, it's more about what I can control, and that's my play. I think I'm I'm calm, cool, and collected. Extreme Chess Game One. Start your clock. And we are off. The clocks are started with Sean against Casa. Sean playing white. And Casa playing black, playing a variation of the Sicilian defense called the Nidorf. Favorite of American world champion, Bobby Fischer. The Sicilian is a very popular opening, which begins when white pushes his king pawn forward two squares to e4. And the opponent responds by moving their queen's bishop pawn forward two squares to c5. The Sicilian is known for producing the most exciting games in chess. I like to play basketball and I run track as well. Uh, I enjoy playing video games. School have been dominating my life, I guess. So. Now as I grow older, I like to experience more things in life, go to parties, hang out with friends. Sean was partying late the last night before. And some of the players said they wanted to play against Sean because he was uh, you know, dancing late last night at the club. I think playing him in the first round would be pretty much a free point. We'll have to see whether this helps or hurts Sean. It looks like Sean just castled queenside. Castling is the only time in chess where you can move two pieces at once. You develop all the pieces between your king and your rook, then your king moves two squares over and your rook hops over. Grandmasters do it almost every game because it makes the king a lot safer and harder to checkmate. Looks like black is moving up his queenside pawns going for Sean's game. That's what happens a lot when you're castled on opposite sides. You start moving those pawns towards your opponent's king to try to uncover him. We're gonna see whose attack turns out to be more powerful. Absolutely. Sean plays g5, pushes his pawn to the square g5. You can see that square is on the g file and on the fifth rank, and that attacks Casa's knight. 
So it looks like Kasa just moved his knight to g3, attacking the rook on h1. That rook better move. What, what happened? Sean, he did not move the rook. This is a fantastic blunder on Sean's part. This is the turning point in the game, everyone. Cause he just snagged that rook off like it was a Christmas present. Sean is definitely shaken right now. I think that Sean might have missed that when Casa takes his rook, he's also attacking the queen, which is the most powerful piece in the war. Maybe Sean still had the base pounding in his ears from last night and wasn't able to see that his rook was about to get kicked out of the club. In this tournament, if you lose a single game, there's no coming back. You're just gone. Unfortunately, you only have one life to live. After queen takes h1, taking that knight off in the corner, Casa's able to trade queens. Casa's playing a very effective tactic here. It's all about getting the game a little simpler for Casa right now. This unfortunately takes all the fun away from Sean because he's trying to get things complicated. You know, he's got those two rooks, but he needs to checkmate Sean. He needs to put him away. And to do that, he's pushing his h-pawn forward. It's a very powerful idea because once that pawn gets to the end of the board, it becomes a queen. And poor Sean, he can't afford to let that pawn get to the end of the board, so unfortunately he's going to have to take it with his bishop. But then, the rook is going to take it. And it's happened, exactly what you predicted. That rook is protecting the pawn, and the pawn is pushing forward. The bishop has to sacrifice itself for the pawn, and that's no good. The bishop is worth three points, and the pawn is worth one. Oh yeah, I mean, he's got nothing but a headache and a hernia here. Look at those rooks go. He's got two and his opponent's only got one. This is going to be a tough one for Sean, and you got to wonder if he's worried a little bit now that maybe he should not have stayed up so late last night and instead should have worked on his Sicilian. Now he's getting down to the end of the game and looks like Casa has his well under control. Checkmate. Good game. game over. It's a checkmate. Rook over to H6. It looks like there's nowhere for Sean to go because the king has got him boxed in. What do you think, Jen? Very smooth performance by Casa. Good technique. Didn't Absolutely. just snap that rook off and the rest was child's play for him. Casa's definitely one of our favorites now in the rest of the tournament. Let's see what the players have to say. This game definitely shows me that I have to go home and open up the books and definitely start practicing again because Casa right now is at the top of his game. I said before the round that I'd go forward and be really aggressive, and that's what I tried to do. It seems like today he got the best of me. Unfortunately for my opponent, I won the game. So do you feel confident going forward now? It's definitely nice to get the, the monkey off your back the first game. I was really anxious about playing first, and no one wants to be the first to walk away. As long as I uh, worry about myself and not about my opponents, I think anything is possible. For our next game, we have Justice versus Kevin, two of our youngest players in the entire Extreme Chess Championship. It's going to be an exciting game. Oh yes, in fact they are our two youngest players. So, interesting that they got paired against each other in the very first round. And Justice, the youngest African American master in history. And Kevin, a very strong chess master from Maryland. Let's see what the players have to say. So how do you feel about the matchup with Justice? Are um, you feeling nervous at all? Not really. I think it's a good experience because I haven't played Justice at all. I'll see what it's like. Justice, how do you feel about the matchup with Kevin? I can't wait to play. Extreme Chess, round one, game two. With the white pieces, we have Justice Williams. With the black pieces, we have Kevin Wang. Start your clock. Justice, you know, is playing a very mature opening for such a young player. He's playing an opening called the Catalan. The Catalan is an opening that combines pushing your queen pawns forward, the d pawn and the c pawn, and begin kettling your king bishop, putting it in the corner of the board. It's a very strong piece, and later in the game, it might end up really wrecking havoc. Now Justice puts the king in check. All right, that, that, that's a double attack, actually, because he's also attacking that pawn that Kevin just captured. So that's always good. And, in chess, you can only make one move at a time, so if your opponent puts you in check and attacks a pawn, they're going to be able to at least get something out of it. I like tennis. I usually watch basketball. I play clarinet. I like the Mavericks. I kind of really focus on my school studies. But when I watch football, I like the Packers. Both players are developing their pieces, which is such an important thing to do in the beginning of the chess game, and castling. Both of them have castled. So both of them have pretty safe kings. 
Justin seems to be really taking a long time for his moves, while Kevin's moving really quickly and confidently. Well, you can't do that in the Extreme Chess Championship, because the players start with less than 20 minutes on the clock, so time is definitely precious. What strikes me interesting is that even though they're two of our youngest players, they're two of our most mature players as well. Both quiet, understated, these guys have nothing but chess on their mind. What it would be like to be 12 years old again, uh, and only be able to think about chess. <laughs> But I, I, I'm kind of interested by Justice's last move. He played his pawn to g4, and that's a little bit of a risky move. The king is really protected by the pawns in front of it. So when you start pushing them, you know, it's cool because you're getting aggressive, but it's also not cool because your king is getting airier. Absolutely. Kevin really took great advantage of it by posting his knight up on the f4 square, and I really like that. Getting an advanced square for your knight is crucial because knights are not long-range pieces. So the closer you can get your knight to your opponent's position is huge. And now a huge trade just took place. This is a key moment in the game. He gave his opponent Justice a hard decision to make. You are absolutely correct. Now, if Justice captures with the bishop, he's going to lose a pawn. That pawn that the bishop is now protecting on the h-file. And if he takes with a pawn, that's ugly. I think if I was in this situation, I'd probably take with the pawn. Save that pawn on h3. No, Justice decides to take with the bishop, just losing a pawn. Not only has he lost a pawn, look at his clock. He's down majorly on time, and this really is disappointing to Justice. I know he wanted to become the first extreme chess champion, and it looks like his dreams might be shot in the very first round. Who knows, he might have a chance to come back in this game. What I do like, though, is that bishop we talked about earlier on the long diagonal is still a strong piece. So I think he made the right decision here to stay active and give up a pawn. Let's see if he can get out of this. I really like this maneuver that he's making. He's pushing his pawn to attack Kevin's queen, and then when Kevin moves his queen, he's pushing his other pawn. And now this is really fascinating, because if Kevin recaptures that pawn, Justice is going to take his queen and take that rock. And that's going to lead to one of the most interesting imbalances in chess, where you take your most powerful piece, the queen, and in return, you get two rooks. If you look at the point system, they say that the queen's worth nine and the rooks are worth five each. Now, I'm no mathematician, but that means that the rooks should just be a tiny bit better, right? Well, let's see which player uses their pieces better in this situation. And what, what's really going to come down to is that knight in the corner of the board. The knight on h3. Is, is it a good thing or a bad thing? The knight on the rim is grim. Kevin is threatening checkmate with this move, queen to f6. He's going to bring his queen right down the board to capture that pawn. And Justice, of course, he sees it. He moves his rook backwards to defend the square. Justice is trying to get his king into a safer situation while trying to maneuver those rooks in a way to put some pressure on Kevin. Kevin actually ends up sacrificing a pawn, hoping that Justice will take it with the rook and forget about the checkmate threat. And he moves his rook to attack the queen and defend that square at the same time. That's a little scary. You know, not only did Justice not miss the checkmate in one, but he ends up just capturing that pawn. Now it looks like Justice has got the upper hand all of a sudden. He has avoided all sorts of checks and mate threats by Kevin, and now his rooks are getting busy. I don't see how Kevin's gonna be able to defend against all these threats. That knight in the middle of the board is so powerful, and it's working in perfect concert with the two rooks. <laughs> We're down to a couple of minutes left. Justice is now threatening to checkmate. When he moved his knight to a brilliant outpost, now this time it looks like the knight on the rim is kicking some butt. Oh, indeed. That was a great maneuver. I said the knight looked good in the center of the board, and Justice was like, I don't care how it looks, I'm going to put it into an even better square. That's what makes a champion. Absolutely. Now they're moving so quickly, we can barely keep track. Oh, Justice has played rook takes pawn check, and the king is forced into the very end of the board. It has almost no moves. No matter what Kevin does, he's really toast here. It looks like Justice is going to have himself an opportunity to get checkmate to. That rook moves right down the board like rooks love to do, and if Jack, the only way for Kevin to stop the mate is to interfere his most precious piece. But now Justice gets to play rook takes queen, check, mate, goodbye. Check me. Game over. Uh -oh.
It was a colossal, colossal comeback on the part of Justice. It looked like Kevin had him by the throat. It was all over, and all of a sudden, Justice weaved some magic, was able to get right back into the game, and now he moves on. Kevin gets knocked out, and Justice has another tough opponent to face, Casa, in the next round. But first, let's hear what they had to say. Justice, that was a crazy game. I thought you were going to lose. Me too. Kevin, what a tough game. It was a wild time scare, but it really looked like you were on top for a while. What can you tell us about the game? I thought I had a winning position in the beginning. I messed it up when I played C64 and allowed him to trade off my two rooks for his queen. Well, thank you very much for playing, Kevin, and good luck next time. Thank you. That was an exciting day. We saw Koss advance, we saw Justice advance, and we've got a lot more in store next time. Tomorrow, we're gonna see a face-off between Elena and Alex and Elliot versus Elisa. Girl Power Day! Don't miss the next episode of the Extreme Chess Championship. <laughs> <laughs>